Okay, hi everyone, welcome. Welcome to the SID data maintenance session, Back to the Basics. Um, I'm Jenny, as Andy introduced me. Um, I'll do most of the talking, or actually all the talking, and Mary um, will be primarily watching over the chat. So I just want to suggest that if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to chat those in. And if there's something that Mary can get to right away, then she will. If there's something that um, I feel is a good time for me to just address at the time, I'll do that as well. Otherwise, we might have to hold off some of them till the end. Um, we do have some time set aside for questions and answers at the end. So again, thanks for attending. And thank you to Andy and Sarah for hosting. And I wanna say thanks to the whole committee who've been organizing this. This has been really well done and well organized. And um, from what I've experienced so far, so um, hats off to the team organizing the Summer Institute online this year. It's been really great. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, today we, when we're thinking about which, what we wanted to present today, we thought through what um, a lot of questions we've been getting over the course of the last year, um, as, as Hardman said a million times, of course, it was such a kind of wild and crazy year in the world in ABE. Um, and some of the sort of basic data maintenance, I think was sort of fell to the wayside a little bit. And um, so we wanted to just kind of re-remind everyone of just some basic things that you should be maintaining and tracking and taking care of throughout the year, which then makes your end of the year a lot easier. So we just thought we'd go with some SID data maintenance, some back to the basics. And um, so I'm gonna launch right in. Oh, I do have our email right up here. So if at any time, any of our questions, your questions don't get addressed, feel free to contact us. That email goes to both Mary and I, um, to our support system. And as you also know, I should probably remind folks that we used to be a part of Urban Planet um, software, small software company, and that changed as of July 1st. And now um, Mary, myself, and Garrett still supports the data system. We work as contractors with Literacy Minnesota. So hence the new email for our support. Um, and thank you for putting that in there, Andy. So we'll get moving along here. So today's topics, um, we're gonna talk a little bit, I wanna remind folks that this session is not a SID basic session. It's um, back to the basics as far as data maintenance. Um, we do have some help. So I wanna remind folks where you can find our help, especially SID basic info, um, which is a meatier topic. Um, today's session is 45 minutes. So we're gonna just kind of skim across a lot of the data maintenance issues. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some monthly and quarterly cleanup routines that we recommend. A little bit about GED match, which is fits in the data maintenance because in order for that to work, you need to have your, your um, data about a student on their record accurate. And um, so we'll go through that. We want to remind folks about using the re-entry feature for when you when students come back after being gone for a while, that helps keep their data up to date and therefore your cleanup at the end of the year less um, cumbersome if you go through that process. Talk a little bit about maintenance of your class lists. And finally, some staff and volunteer pieces of information, which is kind of a little bit newly required by the state that you use SID to report. And so there's um, some data elements about your staff and volunteer records that um, need to be kept up to date in order for that kind of reporting to work well. So we'll start with the SID help. Um, as you should be familiar, on any of your SID screens, all the way to the right, there is a help link, and I've highlighted it here in red. That is, if you click on that, then you're going to go to our help center, where you'll find the articles, videos, and archived webinars um, for all kinds of help documentation. Um, so we'll take a look at what you see when you click that help. You can see what looks like the image on the left here. That is our help system online. Um, at the top is a search box. So if you're looking for a particular topic, that search is pretty robust. So you can type in the, the topic name in there and up should pop some articles and help documentation on that topic. Um, also, we have these squares here that list various categories of information that um, you can also click on those and you'll see all kinds of articles and stuff related to that category. So I have highlighted here, it's a training. When you click on that, you will see the screen over here on the right. And this is, I just wanted to point out to you in case you were looking for some real basic SID how-tos, 
um, perhaps you don't need that, but if you have new staff on site and you need to give them the basic information, this is a really good place to start. We populated, we've been populating this um, in the last year or so with some new videos. Um, that Start Here one is a great video about all your SID basics. It's really targeted to new users. We have a variety of video lessons, some targeting those with admin rights, so those folks who create classes, create students, et cetera, and some video lessons targeting teacher. So that highlight, the focus is mostly on taking attendance, putting in test scores, running reports that are relevant to a class. Um, and finally, these two basic guides, and these are PDF um, formatted documents that are really thorough and excellent with all kinds of how-tos. Again, one for admin folks, one for teachers with images and screenshots and how-tos, a whole repertoire of stuff. So feel, you know, take your time to take a look at, at those um, particular SID trainings. And then down below are, you can see the section of webinars. So when we have sessions and webinars, we then put the, um, the um, webinars, we link to them from here and handouts, et cetera. So um, this session here, where you, you will be getting an email as to um, where that video will live. It might live on the YouTube um, channel for maybe, I mean, I'm sorry, for MDE and LAN, um, but look here as well and we will link to that. Let's move on to the meat of today's topic, which is the data cleanup and monthly checklists. Um, and it may seem funny, this is the beginning of the year, you usually at about reporting time around June, and then again at the end of July is when folks are really thinking about their end of the year reports and making sure their data is clean. But I think right now at the beginning of a new year is a really good time to start thinking about keeping your data up to date throughout the year. Um, and making a plan for um, checking in on things either monthly or quarterly, um, depending on what works best for your program. So let's take a look. Um, we have a really nice resource that we call the SID Monthly Cleanup Tasks. And you can find that on that help um, system that I just pointed out. And we also have a link here. We have links are also being put in the chat. So if you want to link directly, you can, that link will go directly to this, I think a PDF of this um, document here which by the way, I also uploaded into the schedule app for um, Summer Institute, the PDF of this. Um, so what this handout here does is breaks down a bunch of little different reports that you should build into your business practice of checking in on, like I said, either monthly or perhaps quarterly. Um, if you have a lot of students, you're a big program and students come and go a lot, it might be something you wanna run monthly, these, some of these reports. Um, for a smaller program or some of the reports that have to do with like class lists and stuff, those you could probably do quarterly. But again, I recommend um, making a plan in your program for how often you run the various reports you're about to talk about. But again, this list here is a really um, excellent resource and guide for what reports you should look at and um, what you can do with the reports when you get to them. Today, we're going to be able to just like touch the surface of some of them. And now if you do this, if you make this into your habit, your monthly or quarterly data cleanup, and if your reporting will be a breeze. So, you know, it's one of those things to prepare. Um, and one other thing I wanna point out is that the, um, we've updated the reports tab so that the data cleanup section, so all these reports, most of the reports that I just mentioned that are highlighted in that resource, the uh, monthly checklist, they're now organized a little better on the reports tab. So I don't know if you've visited SID and gone to the reports tab lately, but in about two weeks ago, we kind of reorganized the, um, the list of reports. If you recall, it's a long list of reports, kind of went on and on. Um, and some of the sections were a little bit hodgepodge together. So we grouped them in more groups that make a little more sense. So all the ones that are related to data cleanup for both your students and classes are all together now in a section called data cleanup reports for students and classes. And then below that is a section for lists for students and classes, things like contact lists, mailing lists, history item lists. Those were all kind of mixed in together before. And so now we thought it would make more sense to pull out the data cleanup ones together. So you can just focus on that when you're working on any sort of data cleanup related tasks. Okay, so a few that we're gonna highlight. Um, I've got a few listed here. We're gonna highlight three of them. So we got the desk audit, which also went through a little makeover recently. We'll get to that in a moment. 
another one to run regularly, and I'm not going to go into too much detail today, is the duplicate report. Um, and that report will run a list of students and staff and volunteers who look like they might be a potential duplicate in your system. Same, they match on um, birthday and name. So I wanted to point that out because I think programs have done a good job of, of cleaning up duplicate students. Um, but I've noticed recently that there's a quite a few programs that have duplicate volunteers. So take a look at that and scroll down and look and see if you have any duplicate volunteers. Um, and so you can merge those records just like you do with students. We also have the no EFL report, which is something people like to run regularly to see if they have any students who should be testing soon. Um, one of the reports I'm gonna to highlight today is the ended classes with enrolled people. So we'll get to that in a moment. Um, the students who are absent X days is another one that I think is valuable to run often. Um, and that is we'll pinpoint students who haven't, who haven't been attended class in a while. So you might wanna think about dropping those students. And finally, we do have a new report, which I'll get into in a moment. And that is um, students with only a COVID test. And I'll get to that in a minute. We're talking about the fact that the COVID test um, is, is gonna go, is not gonna be allowed to be assigned anymore for students beginning in October. Okay. All right, so here's the desk audit. And so I, I think most folks who do data work with, with SID should be familiar with this. We go over this often at the um, end of the year reporting time. So what we've done a little facelift to this to this report um, just in the last few days, we updated it. And um, this report, what we what we try to get um, the value of this report is that it assembles a bunch of different items um, to help you see which students might be missing any information, missing any student data, students that might have mismatched or potential data errors. And these are all valuable for your end of the year reporting. So when you report to the state and re report to the feds, um, or when the state then reports to the feds, these two missing data items and potential data error items are something we want to catch before that reporting is due. Um, also on this report, I want to point out that the report has three pages. So the first page is the one we're looking at right now. But on the second page, we also um, highlight various other tags that you might have on your students like non-NRS, conditional work referral, students who are tagged as corrections. And those items aren't wrong or anything, but they're just to help you take a look to see if it looks like students are tagged in the right proportion of numbers and that kind of thing. And finally, on the third page of the desk audit, is um, we list classes that you have tagged as IET and classes that are tagged as IELCE. And those are both programs where you need to have those classes tagged properly um, for reporting purposes. So on that page, we want you to look at those classes to see if are all my classes that are IET, are they tagged properly? Are they showing up on this report? Um, or do I have classes that are showing up on this report as tagged with IET, but they really aren't? So that's an opportunity for you to go in and check that. So that's all on the desk audit. Let me get back to this first screen on the desk audit. The change that we made recently is that um, we brought the social security number table up to the top. Um, and that table just shows you how many of your students have a social security number on file and how many don't. And the reason for that is um, the state has a goal of having 70% or more students should have their social security number on file in SID. Um, and that is for reporting, reporting purposes so the state can do a data match on some of the goals. All that reporting kind of happens behind the scenes, so you don't get to see the results of that, unfortunately. But it is important to have social security numbers on file for students. And if you've worked in SID, you know, once you type this social security number in, you don't see it anymore. So it's not something that is visible to other employees or anything. So, um, but something to focus on. And I think during, um, during COVID, when students have been applying online, there's been um, a, de a decrease in uh, our ability to capture that information because then you're trying to wait until the student comes in person and ask for them. So this is just a reminder that that's a, an important piece of data that we need to be collecting. The rest of the first page, these tables will appear only if you're missing the information or only if it looks like there's a potential mismatch of information. So the tables will appear in blue if you're missing um, the race, ethnicity, and this is all listed up here in the explanation. Um, work status, these are required elements that you have to put in at intake. So most of your students 
it's almost impossible to have students with missing information at this point, unless you have old students who came into the system years ago before that data was required. And then they also come back into your program, they might appear on this table. Um, so that piece of info will pop up. And then the boxes highlighted in purple are when there's a potential mismatch of information. If a student, um, it, the record says they were born in the United States, but then they have non-US as their education location. That's a potential mismatch, something that you should look into. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. That is a valuable report. Um, again, I do suggest running that if you're a bigger program, probably monthly um, or maybe quarterly. And the reason, I mean, people have waited to the end of the year before, but one of the reasons I recommend doing it more regularly is since our students do come and go, and you say you have a student and you have some sort of mismatch information, you wanna to talk to the student, find out what is the accurate education level? What is, where did they get their education? You wanna catch them while they're still in your program. So that's why I recommend running this regularly. So if anybody appears on this, you can talk to them. The next report I wanted to draw your attention to is the one creatively titled Ended Classes with Enrolled People. <laughs> and this was something I think that people used to do a pretty good job of maintaining. And then in this last year was so much changing of classes and online classes and distance learning. There was just so much to think about um, that I think this got away from folks and that's fine. It doesn't really hurt reporting, but it does affect how clean your data is. It affects how many students it looks like are currently enrolled in classes. So what this report does is um, this will run a list of classes in your system that have ended. So they have an end date. So this example ones, they ended just last week, some of these. Um, so they're pretty recent, but they still have students enrolled in them. Um, and so typically, um, you should ask your teachers to drop students from their classes um, if they leave during any time during the program or especially after the class has ended, um, remind teachers to go in and exit all the students. And the reason you should have the teachers do that if possible is that there is an option in SID where you can select if they dropped or if the class ended or if they completed. So it gives a little detail about the end of the class. That's why we don't have SID just automatically drop everyone when a class has ended. So what happens is if people get busy and then they're already starting their new classes and they've moved on, you might have a bunch of classes here that still have students on their list. Um, it's gonna make it look like, if you look at the student's record, it makes it look like they're still in a class. Um, so it's important to clean this up now and then. This is the type of report I think if you do it now, um, assuming you had some summer classes that ended, now is probably a good time to check in on this list um, and drop those if, if the teacher hadn't gotten around to it. Or you might see, you might do this and see, oh, we have some spring classes that are sitting out there with students still in them because um, summer was crazy. So now's a really good time to do that. And once you do that and clean it up, that's something that you can probably just do quarterly or just try to remember to do that after a session is ended, a uh, term or a quarter. Okay, and here's a new report. This is, um, also a creative title called Students with Only the COVID Test or No Test. And if you've um, been to the recent webinars or the opening session, you're aware that um, when COVID hit and, and programs are no longer able to see students in person and to test them, the state came up with a workaround to allow you to still serve your students and to assign attendance to students, which in normal situation, you um, you can't give more than 12 hours attendance to a student unless they have been given one of the NRS tests that CASA or TAVE or BEST. So people weren't able to test students. So we created a COVID test that you can put on the student's record, which then opens it up and allows um, your program to give that student more attendance. Well, they're planning to sunset the um, option of putting in the COVID test. So on October 1st, for any new students, you will not be able to use that workaround and you're gonna to have to start working on your plan to get any new students after October 1st tested. Meanwhile, you have current students whose level was determined by this COVID test. Um, and after October 1st, you can report those students, you can continue giving attendance for them, but if they continue after October 1st without all getting an NRS test, um, the state will only honor the I will only give funding for the um, state funding for those hours. And the federal funding for the whole year, the whole program year, um, will, will not be allowed if the student gets hours after October without having an NRS test. So 
we came up with a report that will help you find students um, whose level is being determined just by the COVID test. Because um, a lot of you, I think, have started testing. Um, you've been giving TAVES and CASAs, but you still have probably a bunch of students who got through with a COVID test, and now it's time to make sure you find those students and get them tested if you're ramping up your testing system. So this, this report, it looks a lot like a table A, and that's what it's kind of based on. Um, the table A will show you all your students and their levels. And for this report, it's only going to show the students um, whose level is determined by the COVID, COVID test. And then the table below it are those students who don't have any sort of test yet. Um, those are typically your students we call them no EFL. Um, and in regular times, they are students who have less than 12 hours because you were allowed to give attendance even though they don't have a test. So as you get closer and closer to October 1st, um, I assume your programs are working on plans to get folks tested on CASAS and TAID. And then you're gonna probably start meeting to target if you wanna continue getting federal funding for these students who have been ongoing, um, you're gonna to wanna to start targeting these lists to find those students and figure out a testing plan. Just like a table A, this, this test, I'm sorry, this report can be run for just a class um, so if you're doing your testing by classes, you can have, you can run a report for just a ELL1 class or whichever class to find which students need to be tested. So that's a new one. And that's going to be something I, um, you're going to probably want to keep your eyes on for the next couple months and beyond for that matter. So those are the, the um, reports I wanted to highlight that come from that monthly checklist and from the data cleanup report section. So if you have any questions, um, but any of those, you feel free to contact us. Um, I'm going to move on to the next section, data maintenance, which I want to talk a little about the GED match. Um, and like I said, this fits in with data maintenance because uh, the, our system said a few years ago, everyone should be familiar with this, um, our system now does a data match with the GED system. And so any student of yours who takes the GED and passes, um, you should be able to get that information and it should automatically populate your student's record with the fact that they got that goal, that they passed the GED. So I'll give you a little inside scoop on how that works and then talk about what you should be looking for on a regular basis um, to make sure it's happening appropriately. So the GEDDF.com system, um, students complete that before they take the test, right? And they put in their name and their info. Um, and then that whole system is tracking who passes the GED in Minnesota. So every night that system sends their list to Minnesota Department of Ed. And then a couple times a month, Minnesota Department of Ed, Brad and his team, um, send that stuff, that info to Sid. And then Sid does a data match to see if any of those Minnesota GED passers are also Sid ADE students. Um, so of course, Sid needs a way to match um, to see if that Joe Smith is the same Joe Smith as in our database. And so we use a, um, a double screening system to do that. So at first, it'll check to see if there's a first name and last name and birth date match. And you, as you are probably familiar, we have a lot of students with same first, last names and even birth dates. So we have it look for one additional thing. And so then it moves on to screening level two and checks for either email match between the two records or phone match between the two records or last four digits and social security number. So if the first name, first name, last name, birthday, and one of those items matches, then Sid considers that a match and populates a student record with the goal met of the GED. So it appears like this wording here. Now, periodically we get messages from program staff and we highly recommend keep sending us those messages where you ask, hey, I know we have a student who got their GED, they told me they did, I even saw it on GED Manager, but it's not showing up in SID. So either one, the match hasn't happened yet, because <laughs> it only happens a couple times a month, and sometimes we get behind. Um, but there's other reasons that it might not happen that you should keep in mind. Um, one, so this is, if you run your NRS primary goals report, which is on the report tab, you're gonna see a report that looks like this and they'll count how many of your students have met that goal of the GED 2014 passed with the MDE match. And you, this is where you plus the sign and you, if you're missing some students and you're wondering where they are, then you might contact us. 
Um, so one reason is maybe the data didn't match. So perhaps there was a, snap, a spelling error or mismatch or typo, or maybe they were missing a phone number or they put their phone number instead, but in GED, they have a social security number or vice versa. So we, you can work with us and we'll either um, look in what's in the GED file and tell you, oh, they're missing their social security number. If you put that in SID, next time the match runs, they will match. In case we do that, I'll be pretty regularly. Um, but another issue is if you do your own detective work, say you have a student who you know got the GED, and then you look on that, they're not on the list, so you look up their record and you see that they did get the GED. They have this on their history item, GED 2014 passed. The reason they might not be showing up on the report, unfortunately, is they might not have any hours in this date range. Okay, so you are running a report for a program year and you're running it, it defaults to run for participants, which are those students who have 12 or more hours. So you may have a student who had a bunch of hours last year and then they got their GED in August of this year, but they had no hours from July 1st till August this year. So if you run the report for this year, they, they probably won't show up on this report. Okay, so that's an unfortunate issue with the date range of the program years and the definition of a participant student. Now, if you have other folks you want to report out how many GEDs your students are getting, you can always run a history report or something. But this is a good way to check to see if the match is happening. Okay, so you run this report, look for any students who might be missing, who you are aware of who should be having that on their record. Okay, and this, again, is something you might want to run throughout the year. If you wait to the end of the year, we might be digging back to try to find a student who got their GED last fall and you have to double check their records to make sure it's matching and everything. So if you keep up on that, it helps the process a little bit. Okay, so our next topic is returning students. Um, and of course, I think we're gonna probably have in these coming months, we probably have a lot of students who, you, who were students with, your, with you in the past and now are returning. And I think it's pretty easy for you to look up the student and just plop them into class. Um, without really thinking too much about updating their information. So I want to remind you that um, the best way to bring a student back into the fold sort of is to go through a re-entry process that we have on SID where you can update their information in one pretty easy <laughs> screen on SID which updates everything which will then keep them from um, showing up on that data on the desk audit Hopefully they will not appear on that as a student with missing info because you've gone through the process of updating your info using this official method. Okay, so um, I want to highlight briefly the student reentry screen. Um, first, before reentering a student, I do have to remind you that even though you have a student who you know and they were a student of yours in the past, you still should check the person search feature, and that is a way to find out if the student also went somewhere else in ADD. I'm not going to spend much time on that today because that is a whole thing to itself. So you might already know that they attend somewhere else and you already have them as a shared student with that other program, and that's great. But you should also be checking any re-entry student to see if they attend somewhere else. And if they do, then you would want to bring them into your record using the person search system. Um, and you can look on our help documentation for how to do that. If you do that, if they attend it elsewhere and you're bringing them in as a person search, that will automatically update their info. That will give you the opportunity to update their info. So that should take care of that. So if they are not out there in ABE and they're just a student in your system who hasn't been with you for a while, um, now is the time to re use the reentry link, which is on the student screen. So we're looking at the student. Atticus Finch. And on the left-hand side of the screen where their name is and some of their basic information at the bottom of the screen is the student re-entry button. So if you click that, um, that's gonna give you the opportunity to add new information all on one screen. Add some new information, update address phone if that is new, um, and to leave information if it's still the same, um, and then to update some of the other information like work history, et cetera. So let's take a look at some of the re-entry screens. Um, and also we did put a link up in the chat for the help documentation about this process. So this is a look at the, um, the re-entry screen. 
kind of chunked out into a couple different pieces because the ranch screen is kind of like the student intake screen is kind of long. Um, so the first thing is the intake date. So you're going to want to um, give them a date for when they came back to your program. That'll default to whatever day you're working on this. I guess we took that screenshot a few years ago. <laughs> um, social security, if they give you a social security number, you can just type it over that zero. Um, or if they don't have it, if that zero is there, they have a social security number in the system and you can just skip that and then that social security number that's already there will remain. Then the next section of the screen is, is um, has a blue border around it. And this is for focusing on name, address, phone, that kind of stuff. If their information is the same, that has nothing changed, their name hasn't changed, their address hasn't changed, you can just kind of look at that and say, okay, great, and move on. If they have a new address or a new name or a new phone, you do need to check the new box and then type over everything that's here. So that's one little tricky thing is say they, um, they now go by Jonathan and the first time it looks like they have a John here, which maybe they should have written Jonathan. If you change one aspect of this, if you want to type in Jonathan here, then you should also retype over anything else in blue. So Jingleheimer Schmidt as well. Okay, so that's not super intuitive. So that's one thing to remember. Make sure you check the box and retype the new thing. If, you know, same with phone, check the box, retype the phone number or type the new phone number, I should say, and et cetera. The rest of the student reentry screen it looks very much like an intake screen. Um, some of the stuff is already populated. So if the, the birth date should already be in there, their gender, country of birth, if you track that should be in there, um, race, ethnicity. If there was an error the first time and now you need to adjust that, then you can do that here on the screen. Um, and then the next half of the screen is the items that the NRS um, we do report on. Um, and these items on a student page, you will see the results of this, what you put in here on their history page, on their history screen. So what you should put in is you should re-ask now, are you, you know, what is your work status? Are you employed, unemployed, et cetera? Are you on public assistance? Ask these questions, put in the current answer. Um, you should also see if they, if any of these items down here apply and check all those that do. What's, and then when you're at the bottom, there'll be a save. Now what happens with this information is if you look at the student record, then it will bring you to the student page. You can go to their history page and you'll see that anything you added will be a new record and the old one will have an end date on it now. So if they, when they came to your program three years ago and they were unemployed and now you put employed, the employed will have the new date because they're now an employed person and the old history item from a couple years ago when you entered it will now have an end date the unemployed will have an end date automatically if you use this screen. Okay, so it's pretty nice, robust way of updating all the information in one fell swoop. So I highly recommend you start doing that if you haven't been. Um, and that, like other items, should keep your, your data nice and clean for future report running. Okay, so that was covering a lot of student-oriented stuff. We're going to talk about maintaining class lists now. And I already talked about the ended classes and enrolled people, so I don't want to get into that anymore. But one other thing I want to point out is um, there's a few places where you can go and sit and you can kind of take a bigger bird's eye view of all your classes and just kind of look over them to see if the class names make sense. If you're following the sort of um, state guidelines for class name, class name conventions look at the class dates. We are always encouraging and more than encouraging, really re recommending that you don't have classes that go on for years and years. Your classes should last one year. Okay, so the few of the places where you can go to look this information up is the typical SID classes tab. So when you go to SID, you go to the class tab, you'll see all the classes. Um, take a look at the names. Are the names of your classes um, descriptive for what's going on in the class. That's the number one rule. Um, a, a reminder that your class offerings do show up on the hotline. So you want them to make sense. So that pro, uh, if a student looks at the hotline, they say, oh, this program has GED classes or this program has English language one classes. So first and foremost, make sure your classes have cl names that make sense. Um, finally, there's some other conventions that um, are recommended by the um, MDE and us such as if you have, if your classes 
meet live ever since COVID. So many classes meet live now via Zoom or Google Meet. Use the word online. So online, ELL2, Zoom. Okay. We also have naming conventions recommendations for classes that are distance learning, such as MobiMax. Um, and very important are classes that are IET. Um, we like the MDE, we want you to have the word IET in the name of those classes. So again, this is just a bird's eye view to look at your classes. Um, and again, this example is showing you classes that are in session for several years. This is my, our little fake sandbox system. Um, so we recommend that at the end of a program year or the end of the school year, you end your classes and if you're gonna run that same class again next fall, duplicate the class and start it again for the fall. Okay, these long running classes just create like kind of mess in the system, long class lists, et cetera. Another place where you can see a bird's eye view of all your class offerings is a report on the reports tab that we call the class summary hotline content. Um, and originally this report, wanted, we wanted to show all the content um, that are associated with the class that appear on a hotline. But this report also has all kinds of great information that you can just use to get a bird's eye view of all the classes you offer. It shows you the class name, um, whether you have this class as listed as a lab class or a scheduled class, whether it's contact hours, if it is a DL class, what DL program is it using? This one just shows nuns, but you know, Moby Max, that kind of thing. So just one other place, this one's easily downloadable too. So if you wanna like look over your class list and make sure things are lined up, are my DL program classes? Do they have a DL program listed with them? This is a place to do that. Okay, so periodically you may get messages from me if I'm doing behind the scenes cleanup and I'm like, are your DL classes, do you have them linked to the proper DL program? You're hearing that from me. Um, I might be out um, kind of pestering folks this is a good place to look um, at all your classes. And you can put a date range in here as well. So you can look for your whole year, et cetera. And then I see, I think um, Mary put a link to a SID um, article about some of the various naming conventions for classes. So if you have any questions about that, I just skimmed over that. This. Um, November, the Spark Conference, if you are familiar with the Spark Conference, which is for data folks. In November, I'm going to planning to do a session all about naming conventions and making sure that you tag your classes correctly, etc. So keep your eyes open for that if that is something that interests you. Okay, and finally, staff and volunteers and their active status. Okay, so in the past few years, the state has started to make to require that some of the reporting regarding staff, how many staff you have, how many volunteers you have, once a year reporting, um, but that all that info should come from SID. Used to be some folks were still just tracking that on their own spreadsheets. Well, since it's required from SID, it's very important that you make sure your staff are listed with proper active dates, so or their active status. So if you look at and you go to the staff screen, you will see on the far column is a column that says active. And there's a checkbox that is filled with a check. That means this staff person is active. And if the checkbox is empty, that means that staff person is, not, is considered not active. Now, what designates a staff person as active or not active is different for staff and volunteers than it is for students. So students are considered active if they have a schedule on their calendar. Or yeah, a class on their schedule, okay? So since not all staff are in classes, since even some volunteers help in the office maybe, they're also not all in classes. What determines if a staff or volunteer is considered active is their entry date and their exit date on their history page, okay? So why is that important? Well, there are a few reports that um, you're, you have to run and send to the state that want to count up how many teachers you had active during the time frame and how many staff, okay? So what I think you should do if you have a chance is look at your staff page and just take a quick glance. Does it look like um, you have a bunch of staff who are considered active that maybe left years ago? Because it's not something that you, it's not gonna hurt anything as far as you're concerned on your day-to-day -day work, whether they're considered active or not. So it only comes to, um, to be, um, to feel important at reporting time. 
So you're not thinking about it often. So take a look and see if it looks like you have a lot of staff who are considered active, even though maybe they aren't. Um, and it's this table seven, which is one of the national reporting system tables that you turn in once a year. Um, this is one of the main tables that requires proper um, active information about a staff person and volunteers. Okay, so as you can see, um, this is gonna count up how many active volunteers you have during the date range of the report and how many um, staff part-time and full-time. So if you don't have to run this report, don't worry too much about it, but just know that um, the staff person's status of being active and a volunteer's person's status of being active is going to then determine whether they'll be counted on this report. So that's just why you're gonna to wanna to maintain that. I hope um, that makes sense. So this is the report that gets run once a year. And then I'll show you another place where you can look. Um, we have a report. If you go to the report tab, the list of all the reports, there's a report called the um, Staff and Volunteer Information Report. And that is where you can go and you can see all your staff. You can see what their entry date was and what their exit date is if they have one. This report will tell you if they are then considered active for the date range that you put in. Um, and then there's a quirky little thing where some of the, um, the admin folks, the paraprofessional folks are considered active if they were active on a, what we call a snapshot date of October 1st. That sounds a little complicated, but all you have to know is look at your list and see if there's any folks on this list who haven't been with you in a while, but that looks like they are considered active, go into that record, go to their history page and give them an exit date. Give them the exit date to reflect back in the past when they um, actually likely exited. Then they will start appearing on these various reports as accurate, accurately active <laughs> for the time that you're looking for. And I think we are almost out of time, which is perfect timing for any question and answers. So let me see if I can get the chat up. I lost my chat. Yes, I lost my chat. So, uh, Mary, are there any questions? I might have to ask you to um, turn your, unmute yourself. I disappeared yep. my chat window. <laughs> oh, no problem. Um, okay. They posted, Andy posted the SID support number uh, email address here. And okay. there aren't any questions at this point. Okay. But we're always reachable and always happy to help. If somebody has a specific question about people in their program or a class that isn't doing what it's supposed to do, yeah. Um, or GEDs that are missing, whatever you have that you need our assistance with, we're always happy to help. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I, uh, I think <coughs> folks are ready to take off for lunch break, right? So thanks for coming to our session. Um, hey, here's the email is, where you can reach us. Oh, yes. There is a question that just popped up. Okay, uh, great. If we're in a small consortium, uh, such as Dakota Prairie, uh, do you have to end a class every year? Yes, we still recommend that you end the class every year. Um, it does. I know the class, your class list might not get really out of control, like some bigger programs class list might, but it's just best practice to end it. And then when you look back, you can see who was enrolled in the class during that year, et cetera. There's a very easy way to just duplicate the class. So before the class ends, you can just hit the duplicate button. You can search on our help on how to do that, or you can contact us and we'll walk you through it. Um, and then you can move, if there's current students in it, it will move them all to the new version of the class. You just give it a new start date and voila, you have your new class. So <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> it is best practice. And if you have a, a scheduled class that is scheduled to meet on a particular day, but that day has no attendance, such as today, um, mm. how do you record a no class day? There is, um, on the admin tab, and it said you can put in holidays. So if, if your whole program is off, oh. <laughs> um, then you like for a holiday, then you can give the holiday that date 
And then the class will just know that there was no, supposed to be no attendance that day. But yeah. there is also, if it's just your class that isn't meeting because you came to, came to a training, but all the other classes in your program are meeting, there is a, um, a click at the top that's for um, no attendance. We haven't looked at that in a while. Mary, am I remembering that correctly? Yes, you oh, is are. That just, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, and Mary it? added into the chat about the, the manage holidays feature. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you uh, to the two Great. of you for being here. That's been fantastic. Lots of really good information. Uh, looking forward to another great year with uh, yes. so strong support from Sid uh, that yeah. really helps us do our job. So we're very happy to have you guys along. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Okay. And I'm going to stop the recording.